Grace, welcome, and thank you very much for being here for our program today, Generation Open, the researcher's role in the age of openness. A number of years ago, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or what we refer to as SPARC, and the Open Access Community began designating a day in October as Open Access Day. One day just wasn't enough for us. So about eight years ago, Open Access Day became internationally known as Open Access Week. During the past several years, the discussion surrounding the significance and the benefits of open access to research have continued to grow and intensify. This is the fourth year for the UK libraries to host a number of events focused on open access issues. I'd like to specifically thank our panelists for being here today to help us as we think about the issues surrounding the Generation Open. I'd like to take just a few minutes to recognize Adrian Ho, our Director of Digital Scholarship, for his role in planning the week's events. Mary Molinero, our Director of Research Data Center. Um, Jason Bozart, who's here handing out some uh, programs and all from Digital Scholarship and then Allison Elliott uh, Shannon, who is our Director of Marketing, who all who helped this week with support and planning today's program. Jennifer Bartlett is our Head of Reference Services and the English and Linguistics Academic Liaison for the UK Libraries, and we're fortunate to have her again this year as our program moderator. Jen. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you to everyone to, for coming to our panel this morning, and of course, thanks to our group of panelists for what is going to be, no doubt, a wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, as Mary Beth said, I will be the program moderator today, and as such, um, I will be introducing our panelists to you. Just to give you an idea of what will be going on uh, this morning, I will introduce each of our panelists at the beginning of our session, and then we will proceed through the panel one presentation after another, as it says in your program. We do ask that you hold your questions until the end of the session. We have uh, provided a, uh, a Q&A session at the end, and we will also have an opportunity to pursue questions and discussions later at uh, a reception next, next door in the alumni gallery. So we do ask that you hold your questions until then. Uh, to begin with our, with our introductions, I would like to introduce Mary Molinero, who is the director of the Research Data Center at the University of Kentucky Libraries. Her work and research interests include digital preservation, personal digital archiving, and digital library development, with a particular interest in preserving digital news content, whether converted from the analog or born digital. Ms. Molinero serves as an instructor and is on the steering committee for the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Program at the Library of Congress. <coughs> Dr. F. Douglas Scutchfield is the Peter P. Bosomworth Professor of Health Services Research and Policy in the UK College of Public Health. He was founding director of both the School of Public Health in UK and the UK Center for Health Services Research and Management. He has also held the positions of chair of the Department of Health Services chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine and Environmental Health, and is a past associate dean of the UK College of Medicine. Additionally, Dr. Scutchfield was the founder of the Graduate School of Public Health at San Diego State University. His current research focuses on community health, public health organization and delivery, quality of care issues, and democracy in healthcare decision making, <laughs> and he has served as editor of the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, and is now a member of the editorial board of the American Journal of Public Health. I would also like to introduce Dr. Matthew Zook, who is an associate professor of geography and co-director of the New Mappings Collaboratory here at UK, which focuses on public engagement, big data, and user-generated internet content. He is also co-founder of the Floating Sheep blog, a site dedicated to exploring the mapping and analysis of user-generated geocoded data and how code, space, and place interact. He is also director of the DALI project, which stands for Data on Local Life and You, a University of Kentucky-based repository of billions of geolocated tweets that allows for real-time research and analysis. Dr. Zook's research interests include the geography of the internet, the geoweb and new spatial media, and economic geography. 
please join me in welcoming our panelists this morning. To begin our discussion, I welcome to the podium Mary Molinero. Thank you, Jen, and thanks to everyone for coming today. The theme of this year's Open Access Week is Generation Open. As Heather Joseph, executive of the sponsoring agency, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, known as SPARC, stated, this year's theme reflects the importance of putting our future scholars and researchers at the core of the shift to an open system of scholarly communication. Graduate students now are entering a very different professional world than those researchers that came before them. It is the graduate students and the early career researchers that will have the most impact and benefit most from the open access to research. In order to have open access to research, the results of research and the data that supports it must be made open. So really, what does that mean? Open access publishing. Authors can choose to publish their research articles in a growing number of journals that meet the full definition of open access. Articles are free to all who are interested readers, and the publishers place no financial or copyright barriers between readers and the article. Open access publishing is the fastest growing segment of the scholarly publishing market. And journal options are now available for nearly every area of research. Here at UK, we host a number of open access journals through UK Knowledge, our institutional repository. And in regard to digital repositories, authors can choose to deposit their research articles in digital archives, often called digital repositories or institutional repositories, which conform to the standards of the Open Archives Initiative, OAI and enable readers to freely access and fully reuse the article text. This allows any author to make their work available under open access conditions, regardless of the journal the article is published in. Our institutional repository is, again, UK Knowledge. Many authors do not realize that they often sign away the rights to their own work when they sign agreements to publish in commercial journals. There are tools available to help authors understand open access and how to publish their work under full open access conditions. This is often a big surprise to researchers as we have these conversations with them and as they try to use copies of their articles to put on reserve and to distribute to their class you know, often they don't own the, the copyright for their own articles. Institutions that support research from public and private research funders to higher education institutions can implement effective policies that support making open access to scholarly research articles the default mode for their researchers. We've had conversations about this at UK, but we have not implemented this campus-wide. And so, how is this change impacting the way research is conducted? Traditionally, journals have been sold on subscription to libraries. In the age of print on paper, this was the only model available that enabled publishers to disseminate journals and to recoup the cost. Unfortunately, this meant that only researchers and institutions that could pay to the subscription charges were able to read the journal articles, except if you get them on interlibrary loan, of course. Even wealthy universities could only afford a proportion of the world's research literature. For institutions in poorer countries, this proportion is even tiny or non-existent. Open access has the potential to fundamentally change the way research is conducted, shared, and funded, and built upon. There is global momentum for research to be conducted with more transparency allowing for an escalation in the speed at which research is built upon other research. Federal funding agencies have for some time been feeling the pressure to be accountable to taxpayers, as we all know. We, why should the public pay for duplicative data collection and for research to be sequestered away behind paywalls in expensive journals? 
This hampers the research process and slows down innovation and collaboration. Research funding agencies are now not only requiring that research data be managed using best practices, but are, all, are now also requiring that research data be shared along with the published results of that research. So what really are the carrots and the sticks with this? The big stick is if the plans for managing and sharing the results of data are not planned for and carried out, the researcher risks not receiving future funding from that agency. When these um, policies were first put into place, everybody got a pass, pretty much. Um, the review panels didn't realize what a good data management plan was, and they weren't really being held to it. That has changed. Um, grants are being set aside if they don't have good data management plans, and now data sharing is also a, a component of that um, equation. Compliance is not an option. This is critically important to the university, our programs, and to the individual researchers. Now, there are some carrots, too. For researchers, this means better visibility and higher impact for their scholarship. Studies have shown a significant increase in the citations when articles are openly available. There's also avoiding duplication. No researcher really wants to waste time and money conducting a study if they know it's been attempted elsewhere. But duplication of effort is all too possible when researchers can't effectively communicate with one another and make results known to others in the field and beyond. Research is really useless if it's not shared. Even the best research is ineffectual if others aren't able to read it and build upon it. When price barriers keep articles locked away, science cannot achieve its full potential. And an area that's really growing rapidly uh, these days is text mining. Today, millions of articles are published every year, so many that a researcher could only hope to read a small subset of the articles in a given field. Text mining could be very beneficial by giving researchers an overarching view of a particular field and uncovering trends and connections within their own field and, se and between seemingly unrelated fields that no human researcher could discern. For doctors, more knowledge leads to better outcomes. Physicians need access to a wide variety of current and high quality medical information to make the best decisions for their patients. And patients and their advocates need and deserve access to the corpus of medical research. Imagine that you've been, just been diagnosed with a serious illness. After talking to your doctor, you would probably want to investigate the medical literature your, yourself to compare possible treatments and better understand your situation. However, you'll almost certainly find yourself unable to access the vast majority of medical journals without a subscription or spending up to $30 for each article. Patient advocates are some of the strongest supporters of open access because they see firsthand how crucial access to the latest research is to doctors, patients, and medical researchers. Entrepreneurs. Access to the latest research speeds innovation. Price barriers prevent small businesses from accessing and utilizing cutting edge research. And as far as the public goes, there's a return on our investment. Making research publicly available as soon as possible will allow other researchers to build on new ideas as soon as they're published. While in the current system, these ideas might be, remain locked away and unable to advance the state of the field. To have the greatest possible impact, the research we fund as taxpayers must be made available to the largest possible audience to make use of and build upon new ideas. As taxpayers who pay for much of the research published in journals, we have a collective right to access the information resulting from our investment. Science works on an open exchange of ideas. Open access provides that. Open access drives the egalitarian distribution of scientific information. Open access has the potential to fundamentally change the way research is conducted, shared, funded, and built upon. The digital environment poses new challenges and provides even more opportunities in the sharing, reviewing, and publishing of research results.
In short, it will make better science and better scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would assume that you would guess from my introduction that I couldn't hold a job. But there may be some validity to that. Uh, also, I would just comment after the last uh, opening comments that uh, one of the things I was at one point in time was a member of the Board of Regents of the National Library of Medicine. So uh, this resonates very heavily as the board considered the issues of open access to literature, open access to data, open access to clinical trials, which are all of concern and interest to the National Library of Medicine, as you might well imagine. Well, what I'm going to be talking about today is a thing called public health services and systems research. So let me just kind of get you an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. And this is a definition there, a field of study that examines the organization, finance, and delivery of health services within communities and the impact of these services on public health. So that's what I'm going to be talking about because that's the research that we have been doing uh, in the College of Public Health, myself and my colleague, Dr. Mays, over the last uh, several years. Uh, there have been several key developments in PHSSR, which have been of substantial uh, benefit to the field. The field was really early developed, uh, it has a long history, but really the new field, or the field with this name, was only developed around 2000 by a small group of us in the basement of the CDC. Uh, we had a big kick uh, when the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest foundation which gives them health philanthropy in the United States, decided that this was an area of interest and concern to them in 2004. As a result of that, we had funding for several years and we were responsible or had the opportunity for Robert Wood Johnson in a competitive environment to become the National Center for Public Health Services and Systems Research. And about six years ago, we were successful in achieving uh, the allocation or the, the uh, initiation of that center here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, that lured a good colleague and friend of mine from the University of Arkansas Medical Science Center, Glenn Mays, who also had a national program office having to do with public health practice-based research networks, a mechanism for linking practice and academics to try to develop research methods. We were able to persuade Dr. Mays to come here. He joined our faculty. And uh, about two years ago, uh, we combined the two centers, and Dr. Mays became the principal investigator, uh, and I became the co-PI and dropped back to a, a secondary role to, to Glenn in this particular one. We had a number of activities, not all of which are listed here, but some of which are important. We had a national investigator-initiated funding program where Robert Wood Johnson gave us and our colleagues funding to give out for investigator-initiated awards. Uh, we had funding that was made available to the two major public health organizations, the National Association of City and County Health Officials, NACHO, which you'll hear from me again about, and ASTO, which is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers, which is the club for the health directors or health commissioners of the states. We had a really nice collaborative relationship that we built with NLM. Uh, two of my colleagues, one of my colleagues was there when we started it, Rick, in the back of the room, uh, which, uh, we, in which we collaborated on collecting databases and making those available through an LM website. Uh, and we spun that off into a bibliographic and other kinds of materials, working with our colleagues at the National Library of uh, Medicine. We established a series of new investigator awards, very much like a K awards, and also pre- and postdoctoral research awards, again, using RWJ's money. And we had a conference that we established, a national conference called the Keenan Conference here in Lexington that's held in April. We developed in about 2012 a national uh, research agenda for this particular area. And then the other area, which is, of course, immediate concern to this, was this research is all well and good. We can't wait 17 years to have it start being applied in practice. 
So how do we go about the process of translation and dissemination of this research? And this, I think, uh, article from uh, Larry Green, which actually came from the online journal that I'm going to be talking about, Frontiers in PHSSR, illustrates this very, wh very well. And I won't read it to you, uh, except to say that clearly it calls for a collaboration between practitioners and researchers in order to A, have research be practice-based, and B, take the research and rapidly translate it into practice in order to improve the capacity of public health to do its job in the community. It talks about evidence-based public health. And what is evidence-based public health? It grows a lot from the evidence-based uh, uh, medicine movement, but it basically has these six components making decisions based on the best available peer-reviewed evidence using both qualitative and quantitative research. Again, you know the problem with getting access to full text uh, articles from the medical literature and the public health literature. Using data and information systems systematically, applying program planning frameworks, and so on. And then down to the last one, disseminating what is learned to key stakeholders in decision making and synthesizing scientific skills, effective uh, communication, common sense, and political acumen in making decisions. So this is what we want public health practitioners to do, right? Well, how do we speed the results of our work, our research that we're doing in PHSSR and that we have been funded to those individuals who are in practice of public health and can utilize that information to improve their capacity? Well, there are a number of ways. These are not exhaustive, but only, only illustrative of the way, how we might do it. Traditional journal publications. Uh, again, I was editor of the American Journal of uh, Preventive Medicine, and we published several uh, special issues. We have a special issue coming out of the American Journal of Public Health. So traditional journal publications. Presentation at national public health professional meetings. Professional meetings are an important way of disseminating information, policy briefs, newsletters, websites, social media. Uh, we've discovered, and it, as have others, the importance of social media as a mechanism for rapid communication and dissemination of research findings. And our national meeting, the Keeneland Conference, was one way. And then we came upon the notion, well, I wonder how about an open access journal? I wonder if this would be of any utility at all. And uh, again, I go back to this old paradigm that uh, those of us in the academy know well. Uh, it first saw it at the Rockefeller University Faculty Club some number of years ago. The uh, caption reads, it's publisher parish, and he hasn't published. So uh, uh, this gives you an idea of the traditional one. You can't read this, but I don't, I don't care, because, what the, because I'm going to make the, the point with it real quickly. And that is, what happened is in Oregon, they went out and surveyed a group of public health officials and public health staff about how do you get your information for which to do evidence-based public health. And here on the left is the individuals. But the important thing is to look over here is the information resources. Peers, peers, peers local health officer, nursing supervisor, local health department director, peers, peers. If you look on this list for professional journals, you don't find it. But if you find it, it's very precious. They use textbooks, clinical protocols, and call the state health department, whatever, OK? So traditional journals, publisher parish, is not getting that information to those individuals in practice in public health at least in Oregon. Well, our colleagues at Saint are at Washington University, Ross Bronson, did another study. He was interested in the state chronic disease staff, those individuals at the state health department who are responsible for control and prevention of chronic diseases. And what he did is a survey of those individuals to find out what journals they used, if they used journals. As you might imagine, what he discovered is only 50% of them used journals in making decisions about program activities with which they were involved, OK? So let's start out with that at the beginning. Only half of the practicing public health professionals responsible in your state health department 
for making decisions about chronic disease problems, use journals to make those decisions. Okay? Traditional academic journals. Then he said, all right, if you do use a journal for the other half, what journal do you use? And the journals that are mentioned are the American Journal of Public Health, uh, which I will comment about later. But as you can see, AJPH is first on the list. And it's a traditional journal. And it, it, you know, fine, uh, you can get it green online, but it's uh, the official publication of the American Public Health Association. Uh, and it goes out to all of their members, et cetera, et cetera. I must tell you that I'm very proud of AJPM's ISI. Fancy AJPM while I was the editor of AJPM. <laughs> but the second most common is a thing called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is an online open access publication of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is probably the most authoritative uh, item. You want to know about Ebola? Go to the UNWR. They say everything is going on. Okay. The second one is Prevention of Chronic Disease, which is an open access journal published by the CDC. Okay. So the top two after HPH are both in this ill. JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, is all important to behind. The point is that MMWR and the uh, prevention of chronic disease are key importance, and the point about that is HAPH becomes important. But why didn't you do it? He said. And they asked him, all right, why don't you use journals? Why don't you read journals? Well, here you go. The lack of time, busy. I don't have time to read these journals. I don't have time to do the lift review. I don't have time to do that. Uh, Robert Shapiro and I have talked about the public health and nutrition being able to try to synthesize the data that's necessary for public health people, much as medical and nutrition is doing for physicians uh, in a different environment. A lack of access. They can't get the journals. We don't subscribe. Our budgets are being cut. Journals are not on our list. Too expensive. Again, the notion of the price bearing to access to information. Too much to review. Not sure, unsure which journals are useful, not familiar, and so on. But you can see the major reasons why they did not read the journals. Now, I'm really confused. I'm a university professor, so I have quite a span of publishing things. I've done a lot of it. I've written my papers, books, and, and edited journals and a lot in my lifetime. But wait a minute, the university pays my salary, right? I do research. Some of it's reimbursed by a grant, uh, by somebody, RWJ, NIH, whoever, and some by UK, all right? Now, what I do is after I get that information, I send free my intellectual capital to research projects to a journal. The journal is owned by a scientific organization who has a contract with a for-profit publisher, okay? So my intellectual capital is then sold back to my university, okay? Now, wait a minute. What is the university, and those people paying for this, paying for it again, it just doesn't make good sense if you think about it a little bit. And in point of fact, I think it may be a paradigm that is going to begin to bite uh, people in the uh, rear. Everybody makes money off except me, as my intellectual capital, and I give up the copyright. Uh, you know, and the university pays for it twice. It's my salary, and it also pays the library to buy it back. Now, what's the incentive? Well, I've got to make sure my journal has the highest ISI, so there's no way in hell the library can keep from buying it, because otherwise they have researchers all over them, right? So that's the incentive there. So what is the journal's incentive? To be as rigorous as possible, Make sure you get it at as maximum a number of citations as you get. Or we could have access, open access. I pay somebody to publish my scientific information that the university or NIH or Robert Lee Johnson or whatnot has paid for. So what's the incentive there? Well, the incentive there is for the journal to publish it because I am paying them money. 
So the more journal articles they publish, you know, what you pay for gets what you pay for gets done. We learned in medicine we now pay for real relative value units. Guess what doctors do? They bust their butt to turn out relative value units. You know, what you pay for. And that creates, I think, a bit of a problem. Uh, I found this little number, and that is, um, uh, you know, most scientists regard the new streamlined public review, our peer review process, as quite an improvement. So one of the problems I had with open access journals is, do they really do peer review, or are they really just interested in publishing papers so you can write a check? Okay? So here's a lovely article by a fellow named Bohannon published in science. And what he did is he created this bogus article. Any of your interested, I'm happy to share it with you. It's absolute garbage. Just trash. Okay? And he submitted it to 300 plus online journals, open access journals. The time of his publication in science, 157 had accepted it. 98 rejected it. 29 seemed to be non-functional sites. 20 were still in, refu uh, were still in review. 60% of those had no evidence of peer review whatsoever. Of the 108 that were reviewed, only 36 generated bad peer reviews, and of that, 16 accepted them anyway. Okay? So we've got a real problem with the open access journals from my perspective. But we decided, what the heck, we're, we're, we're more honest and upstanding and outstanding citizens than, than most of the open access peer review or open access journals. So we'll do it right. So we decided to proceed in spite of that, and we created Frontiers and PHSSR. And let me give a great deal of shout out and thanks to several people. First is UK Library Resources. They have a contract with the University of California for a thing called BPRIS which is a software editorial manager that because we are part of the University of Kentucky, it's free to us. That means that I don't have to pay for the software for an editorial manager. The second thing is my colleague, Glenn Mays, with whom I work on a daily basis, who said, this is a damn good idea. <laughs> the third thing is Robert Shapiro, who's our liaison library, uh, who came to, look from public health, who came to me and said, have you heard about B-Press and the opportunity to do this? And, I, and we said, no, but sounds like an interesting and good idea. So Robert, myself, Glenn, and some other folks around here, team at the library and a team at the, at the uh, back at the, the National Coordinating Center, decided we'd launch this, and we did. We were lucky also in that Robert Wood Johnson has made available to us uh, a, a dissemination and innovation team are at, at the National Coordinating Center. We have somebody who runs a website, social media, all that sort of thing. We have good uh, rapport with our, uh, with our authors, whom we bankroll. Remember all those grants we passed out? Some help with the reports. We tell them how to structure their reports so they look like our journal. Duh. Research assistance available so that our managing editor originally was Robert, but he got so busy that we took a doctoral student and that became our managing editor. And we had an open to minimal foundation, Robert with Johnson Foundation, so we don't charge any audit fees. So it's free to the author and free to the people get. And we said, wait a minute, the MMWR is kind of the industry standard, so let's just use the MMWR format for our particular journal because it gets around a lot of the things that some people said in the interview that are in the survey that they didn't like. It's limited to a limited number of words. First paragraph, second section, and it talks about, you can see, an abstract, 100, 200 words, one, two paragraph, <coughs> results highlighting the dot. And a great idea, the summary box. This thing I love. The MMWR does it and we does it. And it, it basically is a box at the end of the article where you, the author answers three questions. What's already known about this topic? What is added to this report? And what are the implications for public health process? You go to the back of it and you know immediately what you ought to be doing. Uh, this is the MMWR. It's a screenshot online on their particular website. This is a screenshot of Frontiers and PHSSR. I think it's a pretty slick one. 
again, I give thanks to our folks, our design people, uh, Anna Hoover and, and Karen uh, Richardson for creating this, uh, this design. And you can see here is your email to subscribe. And we have a substantial number of subscribers and a substantial number of hits on this puppet. We wanted to get it read. So what do we do? You'll go to our that website. You will see, first thing you see almost is the uh, is frontiers. We used our social media capacity to get the word out by frontiers. You can out on Twitter, it's on Facebook, and all the other social media activities. We have mailing lists that included all those who ever attended the Keeneland Conference, or for that matter, the Academy of Health uh, equivalent. Our grantees, remember those folks? Major authors. And we got an agreement because we had a good working relationship with Astro and Nature, remember those guys? Uh, to reproduce abstracts in their newsletters along with the, uh, uh, with the website address. And then Annual Review of Public Health, which is an uh, annual review of the highest ISI in anybody <coughs> published to them for review articles. So only once a year. So it's ISI and that's the ceiling that you use the heck out of it. But they gave us a full, full page of ad, a full, full ad page if we would publish summaries of some occasionally of their articles in the annual reviews, which we said, sure, not a problem. And we recently had a coup. Remember I told you the most often read journal was the American Journal of Public Health? We reached an agreement recently with the American Journal of Public Health that starting this month's issue, the American Journal of Public Health is, is a, a benefit. That is the official journal of HAPA, 40 plus thousand they have ex they have agreed to publish the abstracts from Frontiers in the American Journal of Public Health on an, on a monthly basis and give the website address to Frontiers. We think that's going to drive a whole lot of people to Frontiers to increase our vision, certainly in place to increase our high shot vision. But it ain't all roses and, and uh, daffodils, you know. There are problems with being and running and open access to the only way we're trying to do it. We want to get this puppy indexed in PubMed. And Robert and I have been sweating bullets over this. How long have we Robert and I and some of the other folks in the same uh, we, we, we can make it. And, uh, we we sent it uh, in LA, and that's a church. You got just a few problems. First thing you got to convert it to HTML. All right. Now we found out we could do that. But to do that, we've got to pay ten thousand dollars once for the program to do that conversion, plus two thousand dollars per year in order to do that. Right? Not only that, our copy editing was not up to speed because we were using graduate student help to copy edit. Okay. So we need professional copy editing. Okay. We know that because we have part-time professional staff, and that means that when the RA goes on vacation, not like it's done, we have the same problem as everybody else, getting good manuscripts, getting good timely reviews, because it's a rapid cycle, rapid turnaround. Then we've had questions about, do we do a periodical, like a monthly, or publish on a rolling basis, and getting readers and citations. So we're beginning to see that uh, occur. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Anyway, it's I mean it's it's a really interesting conversation. So are we are we good? All right. Um, I want to continue uh, with this topic. Uh, it's uh, you know really great to uh, be able to follow up such a great uh, speaker, sort of bringing up some really key aspects of open uh, access publishing. Uh, the task I was given was to talk more about uh, using and sharing data in sort of an open access kind of way, uh, thinking about how it works in terms of uh, promoting research, or as I sort of cheekily put in, fun and profit. Uh, but we got to cross that out. But, uh, but I, I do think it is really sort of fun, uh, particularly the way that we, uh, I've sort of come at, at, at this. And just to give you a bit of a bit of some background here, my own research is really focused on using uh, geotagged social media data. It's probably the easiest way to think about that. Everything from geotagged tweets, Flickr photos, Foursquare check-ins, what have you. All that social media that everyone's sort of busily doing on their phones, 
uh, is stuff that's really useful for me as a geographer to look at, to ask questions, to, to, to look at some things uh, in terms of what, what does it show us about society? How, how is this changing the way society functions? How we see, see places, how we interact with each other, how we interact with places and so forth. And the sort of graphic that I use a lot is imagining uh, this is sort of what we're, work, we're walking through today. Uh, there's a normal material environment, but there's this whole layer of information. Uh, it's not just social media, that, but that's what I sort of really focus on, so that's why it's all put up in this, in this particular graphic. Uh, but we're surrounded by it, our phones can access us in interesting ways, and it really just changing, uh, potentially changing the way we see uh, a particular place, uh, the way that we interact with each other, the way we use a city and so forth. And it could just be through the interface of your phone, but there's all these sort of, there's, there's sort of these fancier gadgets as well, such as Google Glass. Um, though, quite honestly, if ever, anyone's ever tried Google Glass, it doesn't work that well. It's kind of really annoying. Uh, but that sort of gets at the idea. And I, I just wanted to give you sort of a taste of that in terms of the kind of research where I'm coming from to sort of explain um, how this then translates into uh, sharing data, collaborating with other people in some sort of new and sometimes, quite honestly, uh, surprising directions for me. Um, so I'll talk about that later on, but this is just sort of essentially where I'm coming from. Uh, and also towards that end, I just want to put this slide up here to show that we actually have done serious academic work on it. We have publications, because the next slide looks like this, uh, which might lead you to doubt that last slide. So that slide was just sort of like showing my, you know, this is, ac this is real academic work. There is an element, uh, another set of element to this as well, which really comes out of this floating sheep, uh, which we call floating sheep research blog. It's been in existence for about five years now. And uh, for complicated reasons, we ended up with the name Floating Sheep. Uh, don't need to go into it. But it's, it's really is really a, a way of getting out and exploring, in a lot of cases, some of the less serious side of this. Um, but also uh, some of the real, uh, real serious side of stuff. Uh, actually, right before I uh, started here today, we, uh, the, the people I'm working with, uh, who I should point out, all the folks listed here uh, were either uh, are either currently students at uh, University of Kentucky or, for, or uh, are uh, formerly students. Um, everyone uh, part of the Floating Sheep group uh, had been at University of Kentucky at one time or the other, uh, working uh, with me and other people in geography. Um, but one of the things we were doing right before I got here was looking uh, at uh, tweets containing the word, word uh, Ebola, uh, which is kind of interesting, some nice sort of visualizations we're coming out with. One of the things that's really sort of surprising, well, sort of remarkable for us is that there's not a lot of social media activity going on in Africa for lots of reasons in terms of per capita income and access and things like that. Uh, but that's one, this is one example that there is a lot going in particular places. Um, not particularly surprising. Also, it really sort of shows the sort of panic moment uh, within the United States when, every t when everyone started tweeting about Ebola. Um, it's, it's some issues uh, for interpretation, uh, but uh, uh, since we don't really have that research, let me, let me give you uh, another sort of example. This is one we did uh, some, time, some time ago, which uh, was looking at the county level uh, within the U.S. and simply looking at the number of tweets that contain two terms, either the term church or the term beer. Uh, and the places, the counties highlighted in red in the southeast were places that tweeted a lot more uh, or had, had tweets that had uh, the term church in it a lot more, and the places uh, with uh, the term uh, that were blue had the term beer in it a lot more. Uh, this is one we did just, uh, you know, there's some interesting outcomes in terms of sort of cultural markers, the extent to which this sort of social media, da media data uh, can reflect what's going on, on the ground, because that's actually a really big question in a lot of this. You'll see this coming up in some of the other research I talk about. Uh, to what extent is this, 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 this sort of information uh, biased? How is it biased? To, to what extent is it reflective of what's going on in that place that, that, uh, that it's being drawn from? All kinds of questions. This is sort of what we put out here as an example of the kind of, the kind of uh, ways, uh, kind of questions you, one might ask for this. Um, this is sort of a, a, the first step, a really early step in doing this. Um, and towards this end, we started developing what we refer to as Dolly. Uh, again, sort of a play off the floating sheep, Dolly being the first clone sheep. Uh, and as you can tell, we sort of had to force the acronym to, uh, to work. Uh, I'm not entirely happy with what it came out. But the idea, one of the things that we that developed out of the, you know, working with, uh, uh, with the, the floating sheep project and the larger project is 
one of the, the things that prevented a lot of people from doing similar work is just getting access to this stuff. Um, it's big data in lots of ways. The, the database we have right now, we've been collecting every geotagged tweet in the world since July 2012. Uh, I actually don't know the number. I'm guessing it's about 9 billion or so right now. Um, we're certainly within that ballpark. I know it was 7 billion a couple months ago and just sort of guessing on the, on the growth rate. Uh, and so it's, it's actually quite an undertaking. It's one, of the, and, and it's one of the things that you have to do if you want to use this data, particularly over time, because for most people, the Twitter data sort of falls off, it stops being accessible after about two weeks. Um, there's some exceptions and there's some, there's some pay services that are very expensive which you can get some access to this information. But uh, through the, the way that Twitter sets up its data, through uh, an API, an application uh, programming interface, it makes this data available. But this is really an attempt to sort of archive it in various ways uh, and use it both for our research uh, but also try to make it available to a larger group of research, uh, resources. And we, we were quite fortunate to uh, get some uh, seed funding from the, the VP for Research at the University of Kentucky as well as, well as the College of Arts and Sciences uh, and the Department of Geography to put this together. But in, in a lot of ways, it's really sort of run on a shoestring. We use all kinds of open source uh, technology. I want to do a shout out here to Atta Porthaus, who's a PhD student working with me, who's really responsible for making this all together, putting, putting the system uh, together in which this works. Um, so all kinds of uh, various open source software. Uh, I can't answer any specific questions about this slide, uh, but if you give them to me, I can forward them on. I can, ask, I can answer a few, but this is actually, this is really uh, Atta's, Atta's work. He unfortunately was not able to be here today. Uh, but I do want to give this out that this, and part of it, we were using all kinds of open source software as much as we could because we were trying to run this pretty much on a shoestring and uh, open source is free. Uh, open source software is free in lots of ways. So our first vision, and this sort of gets at sort of the difficulty of making this open source, was something like this. This is what we call the Dolly interface. Uh, there's a URL if you want to take a look at uh, some of the background on on Dolly, but this is what we had in mind. It would be this map interface. You could put in certain search terms. It would give you some information on uh, various, oops, oops, there, various concentrations, you know, blue versus red. This is sort of a, a core shading uh, kind of thing. You could also look at it over time, how it changes over time and things like that. Uh, we actually spent a lot of time and energy on this, uh, and in, because uh, our vision, or at least our early vision, was we wanted to, we had all this great data, we were using it, but it was just too much. We really didn't have the resources in terms of time. Uh, you know, time was like the, the, the biggest resources in working with this kind of stuff uh, to do what one really could do. There's all kinds of interesting questions out there because, again, it was geotag tweets around the world. Um, and. Uh, we just didn't have the capacity to work with it. So we had this idea that this would be a way that other people could explore, uh, work with this data. Um, for lots of reasons, which I don't need to go into, uh, this didn't work uh, very well. Uh, it, was, it, it just, perhaps it was over ambitious, perhaps we really didn't know what we were doing. We were working with a software programmer who was really talented, but always seemed to be thinking sort of in sort of 90 degrees from what we were thinking. Uh, and in the end, it was uh, it, it really never got uh, really never got deployed. Uh, so uh, we we spin it up occasionally, uh, but it's actually not active right now. This is our original vision. Uh, the existing vision is something much more simple. Uh, took you know a couple hours to develop, and it's essentially a query interface. Uh, this is not publicly available. The other one was supposed to be publicly available behind sort of a, a pay or a, not a paywall, but a password wall. Uh, this one is just something we use for ourselves, and it's really pretty simple. It's straightforward search terms. You can search on all kinds of things and keyword, hashtags, time, uh, you know, other sort of variables as well. Uh, but what we do this now, we, we'll do the search and then we'll download uh, various uh, uh, cell, uh, Excel files, CSV files, things like that. Depends on the actual search. You can get, I mean, if you start with a database of 9 billion, you can quickly really get very large data sets. Uh, so that's sort of the interface that we're working with now. Uh, and uh, there's even actually a more sort of pr 
uh, primitive, actually probably the most useful one, is just a command line interface, which is useful if you know what you're doing, but really not user friendly in any sort of way. Um, and so we went from this idea of let's make this more accessible to a lot of people to okay, how can we share this data in sort of a collaborative process, sometimes collaborative but not always, uh, that also doesn't drive us nuts because you know, in the end, this is very sort of labor intensive. We're the ones having to go out and do the queries, gather the data, uh, clean it up depending on, on uh, some, of, uh, some of the criteria. And I will say that's something uh, I could talk about more uh, later on. But uh, depending, on, uh, depending on who it is and the kind of questions they're asking, uh, there is some issues with uh, you know, privacy in this. I mean, a lot of people tweet. Uh, a lot, and there's all kinds of privacy issues. So we sort of t evaluate that on a on a case by case basis. I can go in more detail if you want, but essentially we put the word out through various social media channels and other things that this data, this resource is out there. If people are interested in a project, uh, they can access to the data. We we have sort of a, a bit of a uh, uh, a bit of a uh, screening process. It's not really a screening process. We basically we, we ask people to say, well, what's your research question? What kind of data do you want? Uh, and you know, we'll we'll check it. And as long as it's not a project we're actively working on, we generally will share the data. But those just those two simple questions actually keep a lot of people from pursuing it, because unless you have a clear thought through question, it's kind of it's a lot of work to uh, to go through. So uh, that's just sort of how we we we, uh, we work with this. And I just want to run through a couple examples of projects that uh, last week I sent an email out to uh, people who had gotten some data from us and said, hey, I'm doing this talk. I'd like to have some examples of what people have done with this. Uh, and so this is uh, the result. Of the ones I'm showing here is probably about half of the people have gotten some data. Other people have been, uh, haven't, have, didn't, have, didn't actually end up using it much or didn't have a whole lot of luck. So this is just sort of an, an example of some things that have come out. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just run through these now. So first one, this is an example of uh, Brian uh, Schaefer, he's at the University of Southern California in the geography department there. He's actually working on a graduate thesis. And his question was, you know, can we use this marker of social media, Twitter uh, specifically, as, what was he calling it, as a, as a indicator of displacement, essentially gentrification, is another question he was looking at. Uh, and so uh, he actually came up, what I thought was quite clever, one of his, his key words was Starbucks. So tweets containing the word Starbucks were uh, an indicator indicator of gentrification. He had a whole list of one, but Starbucks was one he found particularly useful. And I will I will say I didn't actually I'm not actually involved with this research, so I can't really speak to all the intricacies and whether how defendable it is and all that sort of thing. This this is my sort of summary based on what they, he sent me, um, and essentially that it seems to be a useful indicator to some extent of tracking gentrification. Um, Really interesting to me because I'm, my background is actually in, in urban geography, economic geography. So this, this whole process of how neighborhoods transition within an urban and an urban uh, center is actually pretty interesting for me. Uh, but again, this is just sort of the, the first example of of, of, of this. Uh, another one, which I think is actually well, much more close to home, uh, Jay Christian, who's actually an assistant professor over in the school of public, or the College of Public Health, epidemiology. Uh, was working with some of our data. Looking uh, specifically, we pulled together a uh, uh, data set based on tweets containing various uh, references to fast food restaurants. McDonald's, KFC, I forget the exact uh, list. And basically, he did a fairly simple, at, at least initial, initially simple, uh, just sort of correlation, uh, correlations looking at this. I'll throw you some of the results. Uh, you can see, so it was tweets containing the words McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, and so forth, uh, and then compared it to uh, a number of indicators of uh, health. He did obesity uh, that also showed this sort of uh, the uh, this correlation, uh, as well as this one is uh, mean reported fruit and vegetable servings per day. And so there's seemingly this sort of interesting connection between people having this talking about fast food, at least tweeting about fast food, um, and 
sort of public health indicators, or at least sort of uh, dietary consumption uh, indicators as well. Uh, he did this at both the state level, but he also did it at the, uh, the sort of an aggregate level of counties within Kentucky. I don't quite understand how this aggregation works. It has to do with how the, the da other data set he was using uh, was, uh, was processed. So again, sort of an interesting, an interesting initial result uh, on some of this. He's actually doing, making a presentation um, at uh, a conference uh, I think in a, just a couple of months, actually, uh, based on this. Another example also at the University of Kentucky, uh, Nathan Jacobs is an assistant professor in computer science, uh, and he does a lot of work looking at, uh, well, online webcams. Uh, these are various cams that are out there, publicly available, uh, that, and I have to say, I'm probably doing horrible disservice to him um, uh, with, uh, with this, this summary, but essentially using these, uh, these webcams to uh, capture images and see, uh, sort of see what can be developed from these kind of images. Uh, things like you know, calculating where snowfall is or calculating uh, leaf, uh, you know, uh, leaf changes, color changes, and things like that. Uh, and one of the things he started to work with, and this is really, really preliminary, so this I just asked him for some, can you send me some pictures that I can put up uh, as I talk? Uh, about trying to compare these changes they're capturing from these video feeds with what's, going, what's being tweeted uh, nearby these video feeds. Um, so that's really, really, really prelim uh, preliminary work. Another example is, uh, this is also uh, Jay Christian, but we also started working with uh, Klaus Lindman, uh, who's also uh, assistant professor at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, uh, looking at questions about changes in behavior. Uh, in this particular case, uh, pre or uh, pre and post uh, getting a flu shot. And this is something that we did, there's uh, Atta and I are also uh, uh, working on this project. We essentially identified 16,000 tweets that had the term flu shot in it, and then we all manually coded each of these tweets. Well, we, did, we actually coded, I think we each coded about 6,000 each, so there was some overlap. And whenever the two, the coding uh, coincide, we, identify, we identified that as a tweet that actually represents uh, a, a, a tweet about getting a flu shot. And then starting to look at uh, pre-vaccination, what we're calling tweet space, essentially, essentially based on their tweets, how, how much did that person move uh, versus post-tweet post space uh, and trying to do a comparison. We're still very much early stages for this. Uh, but Jay was nice enough to make this uh, this map, uh, sort of comparing, you know, these sort of these ellipses that we have in terms based on how far, how much do people move uh, before uh, uh, or pre uh, flu shot and uh, post flu shot. Um, another example. Uh, this is someone uh, out of the University of Washington, uh, Jin Hu, uh, who uh, was looking at this idea of data clouds. Uh, we he was looking pr uh, particularly at the. Uh, the last presidential election in King County, Washington. Um, this is not sort of an example of this so much, uh, but looking at you know what 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 kind of data is contained within within these tweets. There's lots of interesting work. This is just uh, all along these lines, both algorithmically and coding by hand. Uh, big question how you go about doing this, uh, but just another example of this of this sort of stuff. Let me see. I think I got one more example. Yeah, one final example. I'll skip over this one. Uh, some uh, similar sort of project, uh, this is uh, with some geographers out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, looking at uh, the, what was happening within the, the Twitterverse uh, after the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, a couple sort of questions in terms of how, you know, it, it's all tied into sort of disaster and sort of hazards research in terms of, you know, what kind of information is coming right around the spot and so forth. I don't want to go into that because this is actually research I'm not working on myself. Uh, but some of the things just sort of coming out here and sort of quickly after the, uh, the uh, bombings, 15 minutes after, you start seeing uh, the first signs of explosions, uh, finish, breaking, these indications that something's going on. The real sort of idea about this is can these sort of str uh, streams of social media be used for sort of hazard response and so forth. Uh, Later on, it was uh, these examples, you know, this is the, what is this, this is uh, two days after, so it was much more focused on the arrests, the suspects, and things like that, the sort of changing discourse within the social media. This is all geocoded within and around, uh, within and around Boston. Um, and I think, uh, I'll skip over the next one. This is just some, some spatial, uh, spatial uh, representations. There are other projects 
But again, the real, uh, the real thing about this is, from our perspective, we have, we've built this resource, we're actively using it in our own research, uh, but there's lots of potential uh, for lots of people. I mean, Boston, the Boston bombing, an in interesting question, it's not something we simply have the bandwidth to deal with. We're not going to look at that. So why not carve out some of that data, give it these, to these folks, and uh, learn from them. That's one of the things that we've been, uh, been trying to do with, uh, with, with Dolly. Um, again, so part of this is also coming out of the, the, this larger project, the, the New Mappings Collaboratory out of the Department of Geography and College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd probably say is one of the things that re we've really sort of hit in, uh, and this gets back to the bandwidth problem uh, in terms of dealing with this data, is we simply don't have enough uh, skill sets who can work with this kind of data, which is one of the reasons we're now working uh, directly to try to set up uh, some online uh, graduate uh, education programs. Uh, we got a grant from the, uh, the Eli program, University of Kentucky, to put these, to bring some of this stuff online. Uh, and so that's where we're working towards next. And I, I'll, I'll just stop at that point and thank you. If you wanna, if you wanna check out the Floating Sheep, just floatingsheep.org, we're also active on Twitter as well. So I'll stop there. to each one of our speakers. Um, we will now open our session up to questions and answers for me. Questions? Yes, go. I want to thank you. It's very informative. All three of you have been an eye opener. Uh, I guess I get all the virtues of the open access system. I'm always more interested in advice. <laughs> <laughs> science getting more ideas out there it may be good, it may not be good, if those ideas are not of a certain quality. And likewise, when there's so many more ideas in the public square today, how can we as researchers manage that? So I guess I'm worried about to what extent you worry about the trade-off in terms of quality of information. A few years ago, I recall reading a stat that 98% of the publications in social sciences were never cited. So it isn't the case that those sciences are going to advance by getting more information out there. We need more better ideas. I'll we'll leave it at that. Well, you know, there's the, the, the issue, Phil, I think, is, is quality and quantity, obviously, uh, in part. And uh, at least, I think, in terms of some of uh, the attributes of open access, it's key that you use the scientific uh, capacity you've got to make sure of the quality of that. And I illustrated that with the slide, and that is the, in, you know, the, the, the driving financial model for open access journals and for open access is to make money. Uh, so as a consequence, you know, they're interested in quantity. How many articles we can publish multiplied times how, or how much attorney or, you know, author fees we get uh, is one thing. So that and, and it's interesting because there is an online site that actually has, this guy has listed all of the bad online journals. <laughs> uh, literally, he has those that are suspect, okay? And we know that when we started our journal, our open access journal, and I think it's true of things like PLOS, uh, some of the better online access journals, use exactly the same blasted peer review process. You know, you saw my slide on the new peer review process. But you use the same exact peer review process to referee articles for publication in an open access journal as you do with the regular journal. So the extent to which that is a mechanism for the controlling of quality I think is, is, is there. The second thing is that obviously the reproducibility of your research is another uh, quality control. 
uh, that most people have. And a lot of what we have discovered is, in science, you know this as well as I do, you build off of somebody else's work to branch off into your own questioning. But as a part of that, you obviously have to kind of verify the point, starting point that you come from. And I think there is the opportunity with, with open access, just as with any journal, to blast the heck out of an author if it appears that uh, it's not leading you in the direction you want. So I think <clears throat> we've got a system that works out reasonably well, which is peer review, in terms of maintaining quality in the traditional journal world. And so we just have to apply the same controls that we have in the closed journal, print journal, to open access journals. I, well, I, I, I think the only thing, I mean, I, I agree with that uh, completely. I think the only thing I might add in addition <coughs> is that this sort of stuff is going to get out there whether or not there's open access journals or not that are being done by academics. I mean, they're, I mean the web is open in lots of ways, and so people can start their own journal without any real back, and they, obviously they have. There's all these open, open access. The other thing, I mean, I, I, just to echo the whole peer review, because I think this is pretty fundamental, because, I mean, if, when you see what is happening within the way the web is developed, it's essentially taking the peer review model from academia and, you know, applied it to Facebook likes or Yelp reviews or wh what have you. So it's th still the same sort of peer review. I think the one thing that could be perhaps done within sort of academic peer-reviewed rankings and things like that is, you know, do a more some sort of assessment of, you know, it's not just a matter that someone was, it, it, it's not just about being sort of cited, it's sort of the, the value of that citation. Because, I mean, there's ways to game the system. You can go out and if you want to create these sort of fictitious <laughs> papers that are citing yourself um, and inflate your citation score. Um, I mean, and there's in some really interesting compu uh, articles out of computer science of people who've done exactly that. Then they've run into problems because they've artificially inflated their score and they can't uninflate it. So it's a, <laughs> but, but you could take that and it has some more nuance with, I mean, just as Google algorithms and how, how it goes about ranking things uh, is really sophisticated. It has lots and lots of variables. You could certainly imagine a similar kind of ranking that is done or sort of accepted by um, uh, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, as a way to sort of adjust for that. Look, it's, uh, take that list of journals that are worthless and you know, just exclude them from anything, which is sort of happening already. It's, it's interesting, though, I, you know, your comment about the number of citations. Obviously, your ISI, which is calculated by you know, the web of science, is what editors live and die on. And, you know, it is obviously possible to game the system. I mean, if you're an editor, you know, what you want to do is make sure that the paper that you get and you finally publish has citations from your journal in it so that, you know, it'll raise your ISI. So even with the print publication, I have seen gaming done by journal editors who say, by the way, you haven't cited these four articles, which are key to making you sh sure that, that you've covered the literature adequately. And those four citations, oddly enough, are in the journal that he publishes, or she publishes. I, I, I am shocked, absolutely shocked, <laughs> uh, to find that this is going on. I think additionally, the transparency issues that Dr. Scutchfield mentions, it's, it's, um, it's less uh, you're less able to game it if your data is out there and people can look at it and reproduce it. I mean, that's the whole idea. And they were finding that it, it's more difficult in an open environment to do that gaming. And there are other mes um, measures in addition to this ISA, this whole ISI, the whole alt metrics, looking at how things are cited and in a new digital environment, I think that really makes a difference too and will impact our um, young scholars coming up through the system. Okay, yes. So, thank you for these, these talks. I, I love the power of open source journals, data sources, software. I think it's fantastic. But a common theme that came up was finding resources to support it. <laughs> so, I mean, to make things useful for other people takes a lot of time. And sometimes I think that we can get ahead of the, the funding agencies and so on. So we put a lot of work into it. And it's just hard to, to support it. So I don't think there are easy answers to this, but I'm wondering your thoughts about 
ways to raise money to, to pay for time to talk about well, you know, it's interesting because the, one of the reasons I published or that put that slide up there about the publishing paradigm, you know, libraries are about information, information storing, management, dissemination, et cetera. And for example, right now I'm struggling, obviously, with finding the box to do the HTML conversion. Well, wait a minute, we've got a site license. The University of Kentucky Library is bought from B Press, the University of California Press. Surely to God, there are other people like me that are trying to go through the business of getting the damn journal on, on, on PubMed. So they're struggling with how the heck are we gonna get this thing converted to HTML from Word? And why, you know, why the library system because it's the University of California library system that runs B Press. Why the libraries don't rise up in, in, in anger and say, wait a minute, uh, you guys, University of Kentucky pays your salary, it's your intellectual, it's our University of Kentucky money that pays for that. By Joe, we want to make sure that it's available and we, the arbiters of information flow, collection, dissemination, et cetera, as libraries have a responsibility there. Not only that, you know, God, again, thank you for Robert. I mean, we, what we, we are now part of an experiment, basically, that NLM has done to make the cost of a series of journals zero for full access, full tax access to public health professionals in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's an experiment. Uh, NIH. NIH, God love them, said, you know, uh, if, you publish, if, you publish, or if you publish with NIH money, you will put it on PubMed, and it will be free. So if you go to UK's library site and on PubMed, you're likely to find a tag that says free on PMC. Uh, so, you know, what we've got to do is look for these new business models that the president of the provost says, wait a minute, <laughs> what am I doing? buying back the intellectual capital of somebody whose salary I paid. That's stupid. Let's figure out how this works. And I think if a consortium of research universities decided, wait a minute, this is not the way we ought to be do doing business, not a good business model, you could change the business model. Now, it's, that's way to hell above my pay grade, but I still think it's something that needs to be considered by research one institutions. And yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I love the call for sort of a revolution uh, within uh, <laughs> the academic pub uh, publishing industry. I mean, I, but it's also, I mean, it's really tough because particularly uh, people publish in the top journals because we it's publish or perish. And yes. and that's the, the, the question, is that open source? Because and, 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 open source journals, there are some good, really good open source yes. journals. Uh, but, you know, no, wondering whether or not your tenure review committee is actually going to be know that that's a good one or not. Uh, that's that's where it gets kind of difficult. I mean, yeah, so I think it, it's, I, I think efforts like, uh, you know, this, this whole idea of trying to get people to redirect some of the publications away from the ones that are running, you know, certain models to another one. But it gets tricky because the, the those journals, they, they have these systems now where there's the top journals, you can pay to have your uh, article be open access. Which, if you have funding, that's great. In my particular field, in main, fun main funding agency we have is the uh, National Science Foundation, and we there's not a lot of funding there, quite honestly. Um, and so, to pay a thousand, two thousand dollars, or whatever for a publication, that's that's a real challenge coming uh, from my particular field. Uh, and you know, and also that's not really quite open access because you know the. Some, oh, someone else is paying, but you know the 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 the, the, the journal, journal publishers are still getting making money. money. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> yeah. So that that's an issue. I mean, and just a, the other thing, just one of, one of the strategies. One of the reasons I've been happy to pass on data to lots of different people is that I figure, like, well, we'll see what happens. If something really interesting comes out, well, that would be, you know, then they're going to need or want more data, and then. Well, I'd love to be part of something like that, or you know, get a chance to, and it's also good for interdisciplinary stuff as well. So that's been a person, you know, a personal strategy of mine, uh, but I'm not necessarily works in all cases. Intersecting this issue as well, uh, back in, I guess it was February of 2013, the White House Office for Science and Technology po Policy 
put out an executive order requiring funding, federal funding agencies to put into place within six months, they said, um, a plan for sharing data and sharing publications, a requirement for any federal grant with a threshold over $100 million, which certainly um, means National Science Foundation, NIH, NEH, and the like. And so there, um, here it is a year and a half later, and these agencies are still sort of struggling with this and making these plans. Um, but NSF is indeed got a plan together, and they've now submitted it to the White House office for approval. But this overlaying this is going to be a requirement for every NSF grant that that the results be published and made open access in some way and shared. It could be with an embargo period, it could be that the publish and publishers are now getting on board saying, okay, after an embargo period, we will make it available, free and open available. Because taxpayers do not want to pay uh, twice. They don't want to pay twice. And so, um, and it's publicly acknowledged that science advanced faster. Uh, advances faster with open access to the research. So I think this uh, public policy overlaying this is going to impact this issue a great deal. Now, it doesn't answer the question of who's going to pay and how this is going to be paid. Um, NSF is saying, oh, it could be a direct charge for your grants, but that means you have less money to actually do the science if you have to carve out a piece of this. So it's, that still remains to be seen what overall who's going to pay and how is it going to get paid for because there is a cost nothing is free and um, but I, it'll be interesting to see how these policies roll out okay. um, I, I think we could continue for the next half hour or even hour with more questions and, and answers with our panelists but unfortunately we have come to the end of our, our formal Q&A session however we do invite each of you next door to the alumni gallery um, for uh, free uh, snacks and <laughs> coffee and cookies and so on, at which point you can continue uh, questions and, and comments with our panelists. Um, thank, thank you to everyone who came this morning, and please join me in thanking each of our panelists for their presentation.